Um, this is a very interesting, influential book, Cultivating Development by David Moss, uh, which was published in India. Uh, David was a consultant to a project for seven years, a uh, consultant on social development. While being a consultant, he kept his notebook as a development anthropologist. And he later wrote a book about uh, his experience with the project. So this was a reflection by a researcher, kind of inside-outside reflection of the project itself. One of the fascinating things David mentioned was he unpacked the kind of complicated process of, uh, that takes place within agents, aid, aid agencies, the institutional process, where you know, proposals are written, ideas are generated. Fundamentally, he argued that aid agencies always need to construct a notion of success for themselves. And this notion changes from time to time. Now, if you happen to work, I, I also wear sometimes two heads as a consultant. If you happen to get a, one of these uh, project reports now, normally it's about 30, 40 pages long. So you will find this notion of success translated into various aspects of the proposal, which covers context analysis, conflict sensitivity, gender, logical framework, theory of change, this is the latest thing, the, the, theory of change, program metrics, and so on. So there's, on one hand, there's one kind of debate going on on foreign aid within those categories, within those frameworks. And I have to continuously deal with that in my own professional work. But the other way is looking at foreign aid as a, which is I'm at the moment involved in, part of political economy history of Sri Lanka. Uh, make it a political actor within your own society and ask, ask question, what does it mean? Actually, for, for Sri Lanka, there's a fascinating history. This is because in 1954, uh, Kalamu plan was held in Colombo. That is one of the first post-colonial aid uh, efforts. But as soon as you begin to look at that, I just meant end my comment with these two, two, uh, two uh, points. The whole inside-outside difference vanishes. Because very often this whole aid effectiveness debate does not take into account political agency or the ruling classes in mobilizing aid. But if you want to know those kind of uh, material, you can't find in aid literature. Actually, uh, one of the fascinating things in Sri Lanka is there's a first president, Jayawadana, mobilized aid for five dams uh, from about, uh, I mean, all the donors were here uh, that you can think of were here. In his bio biography of his, written by Professor K.M. De Silva, there's a chapter how, he, how did he mobilize that foreign aid. And there you see the agency of the leaders, agency of the political elite. And I followed this up with three other lead projects at that time. You will see a completely different picture of what you read with the, with the aid literature. So my point is, there's a, that is another way of looking at foreign aid another way of unpacking politics of foreign aid. So I think we are going to, and in that one, one of the important thing is the ideas that come from aid. Sometimes these ideas seem to continue beyond projects, beyond uh, uh, all, all aid activities. So I think this, we, we're going to have a panel which will look at, this is not an either or approach to research. Aid can be analyzed from both angles and there are a lot of studies in between. So with that brief comment, I'll first call upon, we, are, we have two papers from Nepal. So we will first have the, those two papers from Nepal. And as like the previous panel, we'll stop for a shorter clarification and questions. And then we'll go on to the other two papers. So first is, um, first paper is from Vishnu, Vishnu Prati, who is a, I'm not going to hold it who is executive director of Nepal Center, Center for Contemporary Research. He's going to speak on conflict and contestation in war and post-war development reflection from Nepal. Vishnu. Thank you, Sunil. Originally, I was planning and even writing the paper on the quite broader, uh, broader issue. Should be okay. Yeah. <laughs> but as per Vijay's very strong uh, suggestion, <laughs> I reduce it to the, the donor's dynamics still 
the paper is full on the other contested issue as well. Very quickly, I will be presenting the context and the major contestation we observe in Nepal and the rhetorics and reality of the AIDS. Here I am not going to present the conceptual, theoretical foundation, all that. I am precisely reflecting on the experiences Nepal faced, particularly from the signing of the peace agreement to the, the present uh, time. And based on that, based on the experiences and difficulties, what sort of responses government came in recently, I will also share that. So when I look to the uh, contestation in Nepal's uh, development and uh, post-war uh, post development process, there are so many contestation. One of the major contestation is, of course, the um, aid agencies, international aid agencies, donor, particularly the bilateral donor and INGO. The multilateral banks are somehow aligned with the government, but the bilateral donor, by nature of the their power and also the INGO, by nature of the association with the bilateral donors, their um, position. And also the conceptual contestation, government policy and implementation, we can observe many contestation, development, understanding of the development itself is highly contested, ideological contest, all these uh, numerous contestation we are passing through in the Nepal's development history, recent history. Very specifically, what is the rhetorics and reality of the AIDS in Nepal? That is reflection. That is based on the evidences happening in uh, Nepal. And to look that, I tried to use this framework provided by the aid agencies themselves. OECD and DAC guidelines is one of the very clear framework how they want to operate the aid in the developing countries. The second is the Paris Declaration. These five key elements, ownership, alignment, harmonization, result, and mutual accountability. Do really Nepal's donor following that principle which they committed publicly? And based on these five principles, I'm trying to look and also the Accra Plan of Action and lately the Bhushan commitment the donor made particularly to work with the conflict context looking to the term New Deal. But these are the principles with which I am comparing what they are doing. I will say, but my general observation is that it is not happening the way it has to happen as per this principle. So that is my first. Whichever, the, among the five, whichever I look, it is not happening. I will cite few of the major examples which is totally guiding the Nepal's future direction. The first one is the Anmin. Anmin came to help Nepal in the Nepal's peace process after the peace agreement invited by the both side government and the rebel at that time. But the exit of the Anmin was very unfortunate because government has to stop them. There was a huge contestation. Government representative has to report to the Security Council against the report submitted by the by, by, uh, Nepal representative on the sum of the issues, and the political party has to oppose, citing that no one mean was biased towards particular group or particular issue. And because of that, it was really created quite confusion, and this integration of arms and army, which was part of the uh, peace process became delayed, delayed, contested, and contested. And uh, only at the end, after the termination of the Anmin's assignment in Nepal, then the integration started to happen. So the Nepal army, Nepal government, major political parties all objected to the way Anmin was handling uh, that process. I am not saying whether it is right or wrong, but if the government, if the Nepal army, the major stakeholders are against that, there must be something. So that was one um, uh, process which really created the more confusion and uh, difficulties. The second major chunk of the support from the international community was the uh, sub supporting to the constitution making process. And uh, about $120 million uh, was uh, coming to the non-governmental se sector to support to the constitution making process, mainly through the civil society organization or the concerned group. And what happened? 
there are different uh, research findings, some of them are contested, but almost 40% of the time of the parliamentarian, the constituent assembly member, was busy in attending the seminar, conference, tour, either directly organized by the donor or the funding given to the NGO to, write, to help to write the constitution, means several workshops. And many times, it is recorded parliamentarian report that many times there was no quorum to run the um, session because all the CA members were in the NGO workshop or conference and somewhere. And the second time, once the second constituent assembly hap happened, the chief of the parliament has to invite all the ambassadors and warn them, please, do not take any of the uh, parliamentarian to the tour, visit, and so on and so forth, because we have the problem last time. We'll learn a great lesson, and now that is uh, not happening much. Occasionally, rarely, with some understanding. So in that sense, it was um, not really productive. The second part, huge amount of uh, money was given to different concerned group. The intention, the uh, written intention was to empower the civil society, empower the stakeholders to raise their voice. But what happened? It created a huge confusion because every individual group are coming with their own constitution, um, preparing a constitution and giving to the parliament. Look, these are the, our uh, rights and our concern. It has to be included into the uh, constitution. And it was quite confusing and even at point of time, they were supporting to form the caucus within the uh, constituent assembly. And the one caucus, particularly the ethnic group, was so strong that at the end, it uh, contributed to collapse the entire uh, constituent assembly, and it didn't work. So um, looking from that angle, again, it didn't really work properly. The, uh, another third uh, was the social inclusion. It, Though intention was to include the excluded, it is good, but what happened, it created a huge uh, tension among the different actors because there was unwritten understanding that first and foremost should be the least marginalized excluded group to recruit in the um, um, project or whatever opportunities to provide them. It was precisely right to help in that way. But what happened, the other group, those who were not uh, getting uh, the competitiveness there, those who were not able to compete with that, and they were totally negative, and we, at the end it created a sort of the tension, and many people were going to make the delegation to the uh, UN offices, and all that happened. So there also it didn't work much. The Janajati Empowerment Project was another example where the donors were giving them huge amount of money for the donor and it became, for the uh, ethnic uh, federation, it became such a contested at the end the foreign, the um, um, development cooperation minister um, of the defeat of the UK has to um, give the explanation when he was visiting. The de head of the defeat has to um, issue the press statement and at the end they have to even stop the funding because the funding given to that process was used to organize the general strike, etc. So it was, it went to that far and just one um, report I was citing from the Erin and this Erin is a UN uh, news analysis uh, agency and it very clearly shows that the descendant in Nepal over the role of ethnicity in a post-conflict history has put the donor agency under the uh, increased scrutiny with the political analyst accusing them for meddling this, this, this and that. So th that means it was a real uh, uh, issue and um, uh, the head of the defeat has to say yes, it happened because everybody was criticizing us. Someone criticizing you are not doing more, we need more. Others are criticizing you are doing much. We are in the very difficult situation. That was the reality reflected from the donor agencies. 
So the other was the INGO. INGO were uh, coming in Nepal's rule is relatively flexible or the politician or the political system is weak. They are coming to register as a local NGO and then compete with the grant given by the um, aid agencies. And their NGO federation very strongly opposed to them. No, you can't do. And Home Ministry didn't allow. The Action Aid was one example who was trying to um, make it uh, locally registered, but at the end they were not successful. So basically, um, uh, the main message here is that in the duration between the peace agreement and now, whatever efforts donor made, it was not really contributing to uh, solve the crisis. Rather, it was adding to the crisis. And because of that, we were facing more and more uh, confusion, uh, contradiction, and uh, consequently, the donor now in the second constituent assembly realize that the time uh, Vijay you will be the um, donor now increasingly realize because after this con second constituent assembly election we have a series of meeting discussion and news coverage and donor needs to rethink and they also started rethinking and also they um, are very sensitive to fund in some of the areas, etc. But far beyond than that, what happened? Government came up with a very strong um, uh, position that it's too much. The donor are really doing whatever they like. Now um, uh, it's over. We will not accepting that. And then they come up with very strong um, uh, provision. One is this uh, because. Sayata Niti, the Development Cooperation Policy 2017-71. In, in that um, policy, they have very clearly put the condition, if any donor wants to support, the minimum amount they have to support is the $50 million. Other than that, we can do in our own. So, and this, there are several provisions mentioned there, and um, donors were not happy with that. They, uh, uh, all the ambassador group went to visit the Ministry of Finance and they were saying, no, the government has no capacity, so we have to go through the non-governmental sector, we have to go through the other channel, and they said, no, no, we have the capacity, let us demonstrate our capacity. If you will do, and then if you will agree, then we will demonstrate the capacity. So uh, that was the case. And the Chief Secretary, has made the circular, 14-point circular, to each of the ministry, each of the secretaries, and also wrote to the donors, and few of these provisions are very directly related with the donor condition. The one is assist only to the medium and big project because donors in their own were giving to very small community development projects. I heard from the Ministry of Finance official even 40,000 Nepali rupees means 395 or 400 dollar equivalent of the project funded by the donor. They were funding everywhere, the small with the NGO and so there. Now the government is not interested to do that. They want the medium and big. So they also don't want the consultant in the area where Nepali experts are available. Only government is interested to get the expert if there are no Nepali expert available. They are coming as expert in the natural resources, irrigation and all that. We have the plenty of engineers engineers um, available in the country. The third was uh, that no foreign uh, study for the uh, project staff working on that because there was a very easy way to finish the, meet the target if you have the um, foreign tour and it can be easily used and you can be reported. So the government come there also with quite a tight provision and accountability of those advisor or the chief of the project, they are responsible to implement that. So in that sense, the government, whether government will be able to really implement is not uh, yet uh, confirmed, but now they have started. And um, the main aim is to somehow streamline and manage the donors into um, the need of the country because in our country now we are facing some 12 hours of the power cut per day and at the extreme season we are facing the um, 18 hours power cut and the priority of the donor is all in the soft side, not in the infrastructure development. Now government is coming, no. 
first we need the infrastructure development and then we can um, um, promote. The soft side can be part of the infrastructure development, but without that it is very difficult. So that means that the, at the end the major conclusion is that any post-conflict uh, state needs the donor support, but first and foremost is to abide by the commitment what they made, this uh, uh, Paris principle, no? the five principle very clearly written there, and also realize the, the complexity of the local context, because um, uh, earlier uh, you were telling, and also the, um, uh, the Palestine case very clearly uh, demonstrated that this is this, uh, to construct the notion of the success. For that they have to do many things. So, Instead of that, we um, now Nepal government started prospectively analyzing and reflecting the international community donor, particularly bilateral donor and NGO. Boeings are often aligned with the government, but needs to reflect if their support is really to help Nepal's political transition. Thank you. Thank you, Bishnu. There are a lot of a lot of things sounds very familiar to us in, I think, the tsunami period. Um, next one is by Rajiv Timasima, faculty member, Department of Conflict, Peace, and Development Studies, whose paper is Policies and Practices of uh, Nepal Peace Trust Fund in Facilitating Post-Conflict Development in, of Nepal. Okay. Right. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I am very thankful to SEPA that I got this opportunity. And Vishnu sir like, made me very easy to take the case. Like, he's a renowned scholar in the field of conflict in Nepal. So he gave the broad picture of Nepal. And in particularly, I'm talking about the uh, case of NPTF, Nepal Peace Trust Fund, which uh, was formed by as a joint initiative of government of Nepal and eight other donors. Though there are other main donors, they are out of this mechanism, like Old Bank, UN Peace Fund, and other. But uh, there are like, some donors, like UK, GIJ, uh, Swiss, and other, they just join hand with the government, and they form this. My main focus of the study is on the NPTF as a special case, where first I'll just give brief background context and then I will try to introduce NPTF. And after that, I will give very brief about the perception of some beneficiaries, how, what they think about it. And then I'll try to move ahead with some good practices, then what are the existing challenges, and at last I'll try to wrap up with my presentation with some lessons that we have learned from this process. The background context, when the peace accord was signed, at that time, like also even today, there's some perception and some feelings among both the civil society leaders, government side, and donors that there's a very weak aid coordination. Also, there is lack of regular policy dialogue and uh, very weak monitoring and project uh, management. Also, like there are flaws, like corruption, irregularity, very delay in regular development practice. So, in that context, we need a specific mechanism to address specific issues of post-conflict period. To address the lack of coordination among government agencies, and also, it is also about the issue of donor harmonization. They believe that it will help to harmonize the donors, as well as it will reduce the overlapping projects and financial assistance in this field. Also, they were much serious about this one, uh, economic coordination division inside the Ministry of Finance, which one is a regular like, uh, mechanism to look about the donor uh, support in Nepal. And these contexts like, favors the formation of Nepal Peace Trust Fund as a separate mechanism you know, under the like, government control, where the government of Nepal is as a funder, manager, and implementer of the projects. Donors, they played a role as a technical and financial supporter. And political parties and civil society members, they were given the role of reason, uh, member in the reason-making body. And then the beneficiary was the, were mostly uh, SCAP people, like affected people, security and peace building mechanism at the center and local level. 
so on. So the mandate uh, reads about NBTF from the, con uh, the peace accord. There are three core mandates, like main mandates uh, that is just written in the uh, document that is, it, it will act as a coordinating body for peace-related initiatives at first. And second, it will act as a funding mechanism for government donor resources. And the third, it will monitor and facilitate the peace processes. If you like, try to evaluate the last five or six years, it has like, managed to work in the area of first and second mandate, but third mandate is very weak in terms of a NPTF functions. You know, it could, almost like it could not like, pay attention about the third mandate. And the core mandate is to implement the main comprehensive peace accords, then other subsequent other agreements. That means all those peace agreements after the main CPA, which was done in 2006, there are more than 100 other agreements done by the government with so many other small dissident groups and some other like small groups and other identity-based identity groups and other parties. So the mandate comes under the NPTF to implement all of those agreements, to care about that, because to establish a long-term peace in the country. So for this, the NPTF just uh, divided its working area into four clusters, where reconstruction is a fifth working area was put as a uh, cross-cutting theme for all the, uh, these clusters. The, floss, the first cluster was about cantonment management and integration. Okay. There were total 22 projects, and 24% of total budget was spent in this area until the 2013. And in second cluster, it was supposed to assist the conflict affected people but this area is so weak because it only able, like, it became only able to implement four projects in this area, only 5% of budget. Also, there are so many problems, complex complexity arrives to identify, mainly about the identification of the victims. The more delayed the time, the, it became more complicated to identify the, who are the victims and what is their actually needs. And in third area, it is about promotion of security and transit justice. In this area, they spend 17% budget and 15 uh, like projects, but still there are some issues that are un unaddressed because of the government and political parties, their inability to form the transitional mechanism, like uh, the commission about truth and reconciliation and the commission to uh, look after like disappearance. So it's still like political parties have to decide about the formation of these two main commissions to look about the post-conflict transition. So the NBTF could not work in this area because government could not form those commissions to look about the transitional justice. And in fourth cluster, like, it worked to support the elections. Okay. And some local, like, local and central level peace building initiatives where it has around 22 projects. Right? It is spent 54% budget. To implement all of these projects, most of these implementing mechanism or agencies were government ministries and departments, government like uh, or organs and bodies. Only last year, they just selected seven NGAs, non-government uh, uh, agencies, for pilot project. And still, they have there is no provision to give the projects to the non-government sector. About the perception. I just brought these uh, perceptions from the NBTF website. You can go log on to the website for further detail. How is NBTF doing? Okay. From one survey conducted with the stakeholders of the peace process, this, this, this is the perception of those people who are directly involved in the peace process of Nepal. No. They think it is working well or good in some, some manner. These, the, these slides just gives a picture that in the scale of 1 to 10, the rating, how they rate about the NBTF performance, about its definition, mandate, mission, they rate it like around 7. The mean response is 7, the average. And about the, its appropriateness mechanism, 6.7, this shows about the criteria to support the project, 6.2. You can see the, all of these are somewhere in between like 5 to 6. That means it is working in average, somewhere there. So about the perception, it is beyond the like, uh, survey and the quantitative data. No. While 
like I was uh, constantly observing about their role from 2009. Is uh, like uh, independent. Also, uh, when I was a student in uh, conflict peace studies, and after that I started teaching there. So I was observing that, and I found the government official. They while talking with them, they always feel that. Even the government is putting higher like share of the budget in this basket fund, they feel their voice was less heard. And donors were more dominant there. And the role of government is not dignified as their term. It's, it's about the perception of the government officials, how they feel who are working in the ministry. And if you like talk with the political party leaders, what they feel? Okay, we are there as a passive witness. Because uh, in the meeting, we were, we were provided uh, thick reports, and even we are not su sufficient time to digest that reports. Okay, so we have to like witness, and we have to like agree, whatever like they are deciding about that. Even in that given situation, you know, it has contributed a lot. It has done a lot. Like some of the like major achievements, which can directly be attrib attributed to the NBTF, is a good case in case of Nepal that it finished, it completed the management of cantonment and combatants in last, like two, in 2012. And at least it was successful to keep all of those like ex-combatants inside the cantonments for more than six years. Though it was initially only proposed for six months, it was extended due to the lack of political decision. NBTF managed the, all the logistic support inside the cantonments and that created the good atmosphere to maintain, uh, to keep them inside the cantonments which reduced the risk of recurrence of violence in the country. And third one, it also helped to improve the quality of life in cantonments and people of vicinity who are living in the nearby areas. And also, in case of conflict affected people, it was uh, very like, successful to only th those who lost their legs or hands, they were like, uh, they, they more happy with these activities, this got supported. And after the on discharge, uh, the team of Nepal Export was supported by the East, and they successfully uh, reintegrated the combatants into society. Then there are some other achievements you can go through because of the lack of time. I just want to go just in <laughs> rapidly. And there are some challenges usually it is facing that without like giving any training, uh, without giving more emphasis on skill development, it sent all the ex-combatants to the community with some cash, to the like, majority of uh, combatants. Only 1,422 were reintegrated into Nepali army and six were opted to uh, rehabilitation package for training, and like, all other like majority of combatants, they were sent sent back to the society. Only G like GIZ, out of like GIZ, only the one uh, bilateral agency which work inside the cantonments, and uh, it provided some training skills for the combatants, but that is very nominal in number, so that could not contribute is large. Like they you know, could not give the last picture. Also, it is blamed for the weak monitoring of cantonments because access denied for government and industrial community by Maoist for last four, five or six years. It was only in, in 2011 the government get access inside the cantonments. That was also one reason why the Onmin was discharged from the country. And it also like very weak to initiate the third mandate and very weak implementation of the progress in the, case, uh, in the area of conflict affected people and disabled people. Also, like the feeling of extra burden by the government officials was rampant during the project implementation process. And uh, uh, there's very less done in the case of trans justice and victims. About the MOPR, the Ministry of Peace and Reconstruction, it is a very new ministry, so it has like very, um, it, it does not have like access to, throughout the country. So it, it has to rely on other ministry, line ministry, to implement the projects. So it is also some challenges. And the major like case, I just like to go there, because if you talk about the lesson learned from this process, that there is more feeling of like ownership in homeland process, if it is supported by international community. If the decisions are driven by the national leaders, and if that is supported by the international community, then we can find the more owner, sense of ownership there. And another like, lesson, what we can learn, peace building is a process of constantly perfecting and never achieving perfection. Because in the last seven years or eight years, we realized that we cannot achieve perfection. It is the process of constantly achieving perfection there. 
And it is also premature to label UNBTF as a success story. Only like it has managed to complete the first cluster. And there is still, there are so many issues, those are unaddressed and need to be addressed in coming days. And there are many descendant groups, like, uh, and government has done so many agreements with them that make more complicated to implement the mandate for the NPTF. And another is more commitment and honesty required from all sides because NPTF alone could not solve all the issues. If you talk about like the malpractices and corruption, there was institutional corruption inside the cantonments which both the donors, government and NPTF could not stop. Because I will like just give two cases here. The first one is about um, the procurement process. To respond in rapid way, the government just uh, suspend the regular financial act and the procurement related act because to support the NPTF and other uh, line ministry to respond in the area so quickly. But what happened? All the like bureaucrats and who are involved in the process, they find like more comfortable zone to for the corruption because it gives uh, them they do not need to follow the procurement act for few years to implement the peace the projects. So they are rampant corruption that they blamed for the high corruption. And another one, either if like they provided money to the mainly the commanders inside the cantonments to, for the construction and other activities. What the commander did, they just get the money and they exploited the ex-combatants you know, free of charge for the construction as a laborer. And they made money out of that process. Where if like monitoring team went there, they went, oh, okay, we have given only one million, oh, but there's a work, is, you can value the work for two million because they have done a lot. But in case of like ex-combatants, they were exploited. And commanders, they made, or Maoists, they made money out of the process. And another one, every month, they just cut off RDS one, NRS 1000 from each of the combatants to make a pool fund. For the to support the victims and other like their party cadres. Now imagine it was initially for only six months. In last six years, they made like large amount of money from that provision. You know, where they were compelled to give that money from their allowances and uh, like it. Uh, there is no transparent account of that money also. So these are some institutional corruption which the government and these donors they could not control because of the this institutional practice. At last. As a conclusion, on a whole, NPTF contributed significantly to the peace process within very difficult environment. Okay, because of the protected process, the, this uh, lingering process beyond the estimated time six months to six years, it required much more additional investment. Uh, you can see both aspects of this. You know, at the one side, it provided like added development benefit for the uh, local people who are living nearby the cantonments because of the construction, new construction and other supports. But also like it added the extra scope, like, burden of investment for the government and donors. And it leaves like convenient environment for the corruption also for a long time. And sometimes it was very difficult for NBTF to assist implementing agents, like agreements because of the very contradictory clauses in different agreements. You know, in one agreement, there is like it supports for one, some projects, but another it opposes the, that. Condition. So it is some uh, my reflection about the NBTF. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv, for that extremely comprehensive analysis of one fund. I think there's a huge wealth of empirical material that could tell us a lot of things. A lot of uh, uh, what I'll do is I'll, there's uh, spaces there for a few questions to or clarifications from, uh, from our Nepal colleague. Please uh, be brief and tell your name as well. Is there a mic? Uh,
when you, <coughs> when you are restricting the for, restricting the foreign aid funds in as far as your government policies, have you evaluated the impact of technology technology transfer and employment creation and institutional capacity building uh, development in your country by restricting by the restriction? Did you understand? Christoph Fein, uh, working with German Development Corporation now here in Sri Lanka, but for four years within the NPDF in Nepal until last year's summer. So first, thanks for both presentations, quite enlightening, bring me back to a very pleasant time that I spent in Kathmandu. I would like to make one comment, but also have a question towards the two of you. First comment, I'd like to highlight the fact that as as far as we know, until now, there is no other peace fund in the world that is donor funded, but not administered by UNDP, by World Bank, or by any bilateral. The NPTF is the one and only peace fund worldwide that is owned and administered by the national government. I think that's to be highlighted. Now, along with that, yeah, obviously, sure. came a lot of implications and a lot of doubts on the side of donors whether it is really worthwhile to invest into a national mechanism given the fiduciary risks and let's put it more bluntly the simple fact that Nepal has quite a record of corruption. If I may add to, to the perceptions that you uh, uh, Rajib brought forward you referred to the perceptions of politicians and uh, senior bureaucrats I may add the perception of donors with regards to the NPTF, who got the impression that while it is worthwhile to invest into the institutional mechanism, because it strengthens national structures, at the same time, money can't buy political consensus. And the delay in the peace process was not because of weaknesses of the Nepal Peace Trust Fund, but because of the lack of willingness of political elites to come to compromises and rather use donor fund to extend negotiations and negotiations rather than coming to conclusions. That's the comment I'd like to make and connected to that my question towards you. If you look at the newly elected constituent assembly, how do you assess the chances for their success in drafting the constitution that has been delayed for more than six years now? And what do you see is the role of donors that they can play? Thank you for this uh, very interesting question. Regarding the contribution of donor in technological transfer, infrastructure development, the history of Nepal's development is a bit bitter. The uh, foreign aid started with the um, almost 75, 78 years back from the small Indian hydropower project development in Parping. And since then, American came and since 1951, we are, are almost 60 percent of the total development budget or the budget comes from the donor. And there were many tests. Uh, in Nepal. First, the idea uh, integrated rural development project model came and all the donors divided the country into Koshi Hill Development Project, Mechi Hill Development Project, Sagarmatha Development Project, Lumini Development, and then they started and they worked for the 20, about 20 years. More Christoph knows how the uh, Rapti integrated hill development project where Maoist insurgency started after 20 years of uh, project engagement of the American in the Rapti area. So uh, you see this project really didn't address much. Of course, it was not only to blame to the donor, the recipient country, the government was also the weak, but we were weak because that's why we were uh, accepting the money from the donor. So there should be some uh, sort of help. So the, until uh, before 1990, 
the donor's aid was also channeled to the infrastructure development and it was good. Indian, Chinese um, um, and many other development agencies, they have invested in the road construction, hydropower, um, airport, etc. But after 1990, totally it was shifted to the south. So it didn't uh, help much on that part. The second um, um, Christophe you raised about the uh, Nepal Peace Trust Fund is the old model. We agree on that. Yes, it, it is uh, still a old model. Um, but you see the work, it was created or not only the donor has the another parallel uh, institution as well, the UN Peace Trust Fund. If there is a Nepal Peace Trust Fund, wherever amount it is, if there is a Nepal Peace Trust Fund jointly funded by donor, why the another donor has to create the another institution? That, that also gives some... I, I was right from the beginning because I was frequently in media talking to the leaders and I was in opposition of that. No, we have to have the one, but uh, they did. Regarding the uh, very important uh, question um, what happens to the new constituent assembly and what will be the role of donor to support to bring the constitution at time. The, uh, the positive direction we observed uh, for uh, some time because the earlier the radical Maoist was in the um, um, bigger uh, number. Without their help it was very difficult to bring the constitution. Now uh, because of their role, very destructive role in the constituent assembly bringing more sensational ethnic radicalized issues and um, the first constituent assembly didn't work and the people realized that it was too radical and in that way it, uh, it will not work. And in the second constituent assembly election, Maoist uh, go down with the other two uh, moderate political party are in the quite uh, large number and with the help of few others they can make the two-third majority. Constitutionally they can make but practically if Maoist is not supportive it is very difficult. Now we have the tension among the Maoist and other party so it may be difficult. The role of donor is positive now. Uh, they learned the big lessons from the first constituent assembly because they were also part of the failure and now they are more constructive. Uh, thank you. Briefly because we yeah. have chance to come to you. Huh? Okay. Nepal, and about the like donor's role in Nepal, you know, whatever like from my reading, you know, when Nepal just opened up for donor's support in 90, 50s, late 1950s and 60s, and after that uh, it received a general form, but it could not like help so much in transferring those kind of knowledge. Even after the new like uh, regime change in 1990, Nepal changed the name of all the village label uh, like committees. Uh, they they put the word development inside it. If you go to Nepal, you'll find all villages like village blah 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 village development committee blah 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 like uh, di district development committee. Even in e every district, it was termed the name the development. So even you can find from our generation, so many people, they have their name development. So you can see how much priority was given in Nepal from my generation about the development. But people are so much dissatisfied because there's a high rate of unemployment, even in creation of opportunity, even this is, this is the main debate nowadays. Last month, I also like found among the donors and the government officials, where to focus. Okay. In capacity development or as a peace dividend to generate the opportunity for the unemployed youth. That's the main debate. It's still going on. And about NBTF, Christoph, uh, I'm very, like, I appreciate that. Also, thank, thanks for you reminding me that. The NBTF is a unique case in the world, you know, which is a, uh, it's a good example of joint initiative from government where the government try to set the priorities and donors, they support there. Also, Christoph was there for f around four or five years. You know, his role is a lot appreciated by us because he, he has done a lot for the capacity development of our, like, the, the agency and the Peace, Peace Fund Secretariat. Uh, in regarding, like, constant assembly, there is some notion among the people about the donor's role, you know. There are some people, they still, they are demanding for the support from donors for their own agendas, you know. There are some group, if you put in continuum, you can find there are several segments. One segment, they are radical, they want some, they have some, their radical agenda viewpoint. Now another, in another continuum, like another point, another part, is another group, they just, they are the statuquist, like, they compromise, they don't want to change as per the new demand. And 
donors are also confused, you know, to whom they have to support. If they support from one side, then they will, obviously they get, like, they were criticized by the other side. So I think they have to play a somehow neutral role. Let the, our domestic actors decide and let the people decide what they want and where they want to go. I think that's a better role. Thanks, Raji. We'll come back to, we can come back to the same issues. I, I like the way the word development started spreading. I can, in the, my last 30 years of consultancy, I can in Sinhalese write a lot of words that in the villages of Sri Lanka people have begun to talk, which was not there before. Uh, uh, recently, we had a very interesting Sinhalese words of, from the aid rhetoric, word getting Sinhalese. Now, we go on from Sri, Nepal to Sri Lanka now. Actually, both these papers are going to be focusing on Sri Lanka. But actually, with regard to the conflict-related issues, it should have been the other way about, because in the 2000, there were fairly a large interest in Sri Lanka when the, what, was, what we call the neoliberal peace was the dominant. And there was a huge number of donors and so on. Actually, when it collapsed in Sri Lanka, a lot of people went to Nepal. <laughs> so so we, are now, we are now going to hear two from Farah, Farah Hanifa, who is a senior lecturer in sociology department, University of Colombo. Uh, she will be speaking about uh, competing for victim stated, Northern Muslims and the ironies of post-war reconciliation, justice and development. Far. Okay. Uh, first, thank you so much to Sepa for having me here and for Vijay for pressuring me to uh, uh, make this presentation. Um, this paper comes from an ex experience that I personally had in relation to two projects that I was involved with. Um, in 2011, we completed uh, a commission project, and that commission project was an investigation into a specific event. That was the expulsion of the northern Muslims from the five districts of the northern province by the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam in 1990. Now, we, entered, we uh, got into this project, and it was sort of a, a citizens' commission project uh, involving nine commissioners, and we had um, uh, sort of fact-finding fact sessions in the areas. We had researchers employed to collect testimonies. It was, very, it was quite extensive, and it took about two years to complete. Um, now, the reason for engaging in that project was because uh, the narrative of that Muslim expulsion from uh, the North in 1990 was insufficiently integrated into the historical narrative of the conflict in Sri Lanka. And also as a consequence, you know, there was very little attention paid to those people and uh, uh, what happened to them after the expulsion. Now what happened after the expulsion was that they were settled um, as IDPs in this place called Putlam. And they basically stayed there um, during those 20 years until uh, 2009, basically. There were certain sort of return movements once in a while when there was a peace process. But by and large, you know, even the ex expelled people from uh, who had settled from other places moved to Putlam, and Putlam became sort of this big colony of displaced people. Now, um, as, a, as a consequence of the sort of the um, uh, uh, commission project, you know, there was a lot of attention and there was a, uh, there was a realization and there was a sort of endorsement for sort of the uh, victimhood status of the northern Muslims. Now, and it was, it was celebrated and well received and all of that, right? Yeah, and there was a recognition for it within sort of the human rights discourse in Sri Lanka. And, uh, you know, we, we felt very good. I mean, there are lots of people who were, part, who were members of that project as well here. And we felt very good about that. So uh, subsequent to that project, I was hired by an um, INGO to do a sort of a documentation project also on the Northern Muslims. I was really tired after this project, but I thought, you know, I mean, I have to do it. It's my responsibility. So I took it on. Now, when I was doing the commission project, I didn't really get too much um, sort of access to people like the UNHCR, who were also... Um, you know, very active within Sri Lanka, but you, I couldn't really um, get that much access to the kind of uh, uh, positions that they had taken. And what was important there was that the UNHCR had uh, sort of committed with the government to a classification of um, the displaced people in Sri Lanka to 
uh, old and new IDPs, right? IDPs who were, who were displaced after 2008 and IDPs who were displaced before. Now, clearly, the Northern Muslims fell into the former category, and that was sort of an issue for us. So we wanted to have conversations with them, but you know, it was very difficult to sort of get through. You know, they would give us statements, and they would sort of kind of fob us off. But for the for the longest time, we thought that sort of the this. Um, this categorization of old IDP versus new IDP was something that happened, you know, by government, by sort of omission, by sort of, you know, the, the requirements of sort of state practice more than the UNHCR. But when I started doing this research for the INGO paper, I had more access. And when I had conversations with UNHCR people in, in uh, MENA, I was told very clearly, very categorically, I remember this, this uh, um, uh, person, this uh, foreign expat worker in MENA sitting me down and telling me very clearly that, you know, that Northern Muslims are not our priority caseload, right? They are not our priority caseload, and uh, we think they, they are um, less, less of a priority, and we think that the uh, Vani IDPs, mostly Tamil IDPs, displaced after 2008, were the main um, uh, priority for us. Right? Now, why? I mean, so I was, I, was, I was kind of taken aback, but because this is not something, I mean, practically this is something that the Northern Muslims are complaining was happening, but it wasn't something that we understood as sort of policy, as something that people, you know, accepted as, uh, you know, this is what they were going to do. So I was curious, and I asked them, what was this? Why? And so one was that the Northern Muslims, the Vanni IDPs had nothing, that was the language, and the Northern Muslims had a plan B, one. The second thing is that you know, the Northern Muslims had gotten aid for 20 years, and therefore, they should have been locally integrated by now, right? Okay. Now, uh, the sort of the literature on the Northern Muslims, uh, there is some literature, and that has documented fairly well several things about the Northern Muslims. One, that sort of the, the relationship between Northern Muslims and Putlam is very fraught for a variety of reasons. One is that, you know, that, that place is just not, uh, doesn't have the capacity to hold such a huge population, and it hasn't for 20 years, and so therefore sort of employment opportunities there are, are really bad, not just for the Northern Muslims who came, but, but they were bad even for the people who were there, right? That is one. The second thing is that the Northern Muslims have been voting as um, residents of the Northern province for almost the entire duration of their displacement until about 2010, right? So that was another thing. And the second thing, and the third thing was that there's, there was a lot of sort of conflicts, you know, during the entire period between Northern Muslims and the local population. And at the end of the, you know, in 2009, I mean, there were even sort of like organized uh, groups among the host community population who really wanted the Northern Muslims to leave, right? And for these reasons, and also for the ways in which sort of a, a, um, assistance was administered by the state, uh, where it required that the Northern Muslims remain registered as outsiders and not be registered as uh, residents of Putlam, where this sort of like, you know, the separation of Northern Muslims as sort of a, uh, uh, you know, not, not Putlam people was maintained for 20 years. Right? And also so there was kind of a, sort of a political identification by the Northern Muslims that they were very much sort of northerners and not from here and extremely separate from this place. And also the other additional important issue was that you know, the Northern Muslims were from a Tamil-speaking area and they were a Tamil-speaking population. And this was a Sinhala-speaking, Sinhala-administered area. Right? And, and they maintained their Tamil-speaking status. And even now, I mean, there are very few people in the sort of the Putlam, in Putlam who, who, are, who are there, who are conversant in uh, the Sinhala language as well. So the Northern Muslims really identified very strongly as people of the North, okay, right. So now uh, my task was to actually understand what was going on in this sort of uh, UNHCR categorization of Northern Muslims as a low priority case load, and also the, the need to have a sort of a narrative about you know, why is it that UNHCR wouldn't engage with these people, right? So um, when I asked the UNHCR uh, repeatedly about sort of, you know, certain questions about the Northern Muslims, like for instance, d did they know that uh, the Northern Muslims were registered as voters of the North? You know, in many instances, they did not know. And like, actually in my conversations with like the, the head of the organization at that time, he kind of sort of, uh, I could see that he didn't really believe me, right? I mean, he didn't quite believe me. And when I tried to tell him that, you know, it's actually documented, this is not like my opinion, but this is documented. It was 
it was somehow irrelevant, right? So, uh, so I've been trying to think uh, in terms of, you know, not just sort of the local politics of Sri Lanka, but in the way in which aid is thought about, what is going on here, that, you know, it becomes this local context and sort of the local experience and the entire history of the Northern Muslims is somehow irrelevant. Now, even in, in, the, in the way in which I tried to sort of, you know, write about it for the sort of the INGO, I tried to put in as much of the sort of the political context of Muslims being, say, a minority in Sri Lanka and how that was relevant to their marginalization for this sort of long period of time and how that was also relevant when thinking about, you know, assisting them to return, right? Again, I was told that this was all too much, right? I mean, I needed to get to the point. And it, it was really difficult for me to also realize what exactly the point was, right? And so it was, it was a constant sort of uh, quest to figure out you know, what are they saying and what am I not hearing and why is this conversation somehow going like this, right? And then it, it, I, I started reading uh, about this uh, text, uh, it gets a little theoretical here, about um, this text called Humanitarian Reason by Didier Fassin, right? And he uses this um, Giorgio Agamben's con concept of bare life, right, to understand what it is that, you know, humanitarians look at when they provide aid, right? And very simply, it is just about life, right? It is about the existence of life. It's about food. It's about medicine for wounds, right? That is the way in which you look at life. So any other question that impinges, uh, is, is sort of goes beyond that, any other needs that are articulated in different terms are not recognizable within that discourse, right? So the need for politics, the need for, need for uh, say, sort of a dignity, the need for, say, a job, right? It's not really that important as long as, you know, they can feed themselves, right? So, say, a, a, a doctor, or well, not a doctor maybe, but... Uh, uh, you know, a wealthy, say, a businessman who was expelled from the north, who is eking out a living in, the, in um, uh, Putlam, is, you know, that, that narrative is irre irrelevant, right? That narrative is irrelevant. Like a teacher, okay, who had, you know, big uh, plans for their children, but who couldn't provide um, education in, in Putlam, is again irrelevant, right? And also, uh, you know, people who wanted to uh, return, even though they could, they had a menial job in Putlam, they could, there were schools there, they could, they could somehow uh, manage, but them wanting to go back was also irrelevant, right? Within that e e discourse, it was irrelevant. So uh, that is the other thing. And, and, the other, and the other part of it also was that, you know, within this sort of humanitarian discourse, there are those who have politics and then those who don't. Right? So those who have politics are the ones who can take a position about all the bad that is going on in the world, who can be sort of a human, humanitarian actor who goes and, you know, goes to these sort of like conflict-affected areas and works in difficult situations and gets paid for like, you know, difficult areas of work and all of that and, and can choose to be in, in sort of war zones and can, can, you know, be bombed out or not. And then there are these other people who are just the victims in some sense, right, who can only be saved or killed, okay? So within sort of that discourse again also, when, when uh, Northern Muslims assert politics, right, again it becomes somehow irrelevant, okay? They cannot have uh, uh, politics, they con cannot have sort of a uh, conflictual understanding with, uh, say, the, nor the, the Northern Tamils, for instance. That is, again, irrelevant, right? And I bring this up because, um, how am I doing? Yeah, fantastic. Uh, I bring, bring this up because, you know, what was happening within sort of the UNX uh, uh, construction of the Northern Muslims as sort of low priority caseload and constructing the Vanya IDPs as the most abject and the, those in relation to um, uh, whom aid should be given, was that also that they were sort of feeding into another discourse of refusing Muslims to come back, right? And this discourse was that, you know, Muslims were not the legitimate... Uh, uh, people of the north in some sense, right? I mean, this is the sort of the LTT discourse which sort of drove them out, but it's kind of sort of uh, existed still in the north uh, in sort of not uh, accepting that the Muslims had a right to return, okay? That, you know, there was no, the sort of, if, if within sort of the Tamil nationalist discourse, the expulsion is still kind of an iffy thing that people find it difficult to get their head around. It is not an ethically clear project. 
right? The expulsion is not, you know, people are not clear whether it was the, a bad thing that they did or actually a good thing because this is a Tamil homeland and the Muslims did not accept that as a Tamil homeland, right? So because of that, there is, there is all this, sort of, there is no, I mean, there's a l large legitimacy for the discourse of return in, in sort of, among sort of human rights activists and all of that in the South, but it's not clear in the North. And in, within sort of the, the political elite of the, of, of you know, uh, the Tamil political elite, rather, you know, there's only very slow acceptance of the fact that, you know, but the, exp the expulsion by the LTT was something that cannot be justified. There's a slow ac acceptance that Muslims have a right to return and that this should be understood as a crime, right? So but by UNHCR also saying that these people are integrated, then it was feeding again into this whole discourse of, you know, oh, they are Putlam people, why are they coming? Right? Now, these are things, these Putlam people, why are they coming, was something that, you know, returning northern Muslims constantly heard from low-level government functionaries in, functionaries in the north, right? I mean, and there are, there are reasons for this that need to be addressed, right? I mean, the, the, the north was monoethnic for 20 years, you know, demographic changes have happened, and there's, you know, real problems of sort of economic integration. There are real problems of uh, the lack of um, uh, infrastructure, the lack of livelihoods, the lack of, you know, the lack of access to say fishing and things like that, right? There are real problems that need to be addressed, but all of this kind of gets sort of lost in, in all of these conversations about, you know, the Putlam people having integrated into Putlam and don't need to go back from the UNHCR, which feeds then into, you know, other discourses that say Muslims really don't need to go back, right? And also the government's own sort of, um, you know, ignoring of the Muslim issue, again, gets, gets uh, you know, endorsed by this kind of discourse, right? So, Finally, what I would like to say is that you know, there are these, these kinds of, sort of ideas about sort of who should get aid and who is the perfect victim for aid. Right? I mean, they emerge from you know, different kinds of, sort of philosophies of you know, abjection, philosophies of um, you know, great need and all of that, that are limited to sort of the body and to, to food and to medicine in some sense. Right? But you know, what that, in, in, sort of in the process of implementation, what it means is that it also feeds into a whole other realm of politics at the local level, right? that, that you know, people are struggling to articulate. And also, given the fact that you know, these international agencies are not just sort of humanitarian aid agencies, but they're also seen as those with enormous power in somehow kind of you know, giving legitimacy to, say, this... Uh, this uh, uh, story that has gotten so little traction even in the country, the expulsion, the story of the Northern Muslim ex expulsion, right? And when UNHCR turns around and says that, well, you know, actually, and they have said that they're not all Northern Muslim IDPs m may be uh, actual IDPs now, right? I mean, they said that it's unrealistic to think of all Northern Muslims as being IDPs, right? Now, in that, what you're, you're completely undermining it, sort of an identity that the Northern Muslims have cultivated for two generations, right? Because of the displacement. And the fact that they can say that from this particular philosophical uh, viewpoint is extremely damaging locally, right? And this is from the agency that is seen as, you know, a possible way in which this issue can be internationalized and can get more legitimacy, right? But in the final analysis, what it does is actually sort of undermine even the little legitimacy it, that it has locally. Thank you. Thanks, Para. I think we are moving from the promise of aid to perils of it, and which arises from even how people are categorized. Just to remind the audience, uh, Sri Lanka was the first country UNHCR managed to, you know, UNHCR mandate, mandate was to protect people who cross international borders, and Sri Lanka was one of the first countries they managed to come in after that mandate was changed. Now we have the final paper of this session by Zhao Zhu, Challenges of China's Foreign Assistance-Led Economic Integration, Sri Lanka as a Case Study. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a great honor to have all of you in uh, my discussion on the challenges of China's uh, bilateral foreign aid-led economic integration. And uh, thank you very much, Vijay, for cleaning up my paper. Um, in this paper, I try to demystifying the decision-making process of China's foreign aid uh, projects in Sri Lanka as well as in other countries so as to contribute 
to the discussion on how countries can better utilize the bilateral regime for their post-war uh, construction. And also, I hope to contribute to the knowledge on the uh, direction of the future uh, reform for the OECD-led uh, global aid structure. So, so there are so many discussions or even speculation on what really uh, incentivizes China to do these projects overseas. Um, central to all kinds of speculation or interpretation is that the, the, role, the emphasis on the role of the state, which people assume that the, the state, the Chinese government, guide the Chinese investment, private owned or the state enterprises owned towards uh, fulfilling certain political purpose. But the role of very powerful Chinese state-owned state -owned enterprises, and many of them are those of uh, among the Fortune 500, are severely under-researched, or just, they are just assumed to be limited to, be, uh, to just ob obey the orders from the state. But what I found is quite counterintuitive. The contractors of the Chinese foreign aid assistance or the state-owned enterprises are increasingly playing a, a critical role as a decision maker, both in Beijing and in host, uh, host countries. Well, the state, Beijing, is just playing a supporting role by providing the uh, finance for risk management as well as the trade and investment treaties between uh, China and the uh, host country. Uh, this result comes from the stakeholder analysis among three major actors in China's state on, uh, uh, foreign assistance project to Sri Lanka. They are the SOEs, state-owned enterprises, I define them as the globalization factor, the China factor, and the uh, host country factor. For the globalization factor after 1994, the privatization uh, wave just spread around the world, so including China. And uh, this kind of uh, reform turned Chinese SOEs from purely policy enforcers of the, the state-controlled economy into uh, independent market actors with a huge fiduciary responsibility. For the China factor, the regulation framework for China's foreign system was established in 1994, and it laid down the, fund, uh, the principle of non-intervention. But this framework is uh, actually out of step with the new reality where the Chinese business, especially the state-owned, is uh, massively involved within the domestic affairs, economic affairs of the host country. For the host country, for Sri Lanka, for example, it's, uh, it, there's a huge demand for the infrastructure financing uh, and this kind of demand activate the SOEs as a commercial actor. So as a result, uh, the SOEs are incentivized to serve as a bridge between Beijing as a financial, uh, development financial provider and the host country government as a development financial market and participate to, produ uh, pr to produce the aid projects in a way that serve its own commercial purpose. And we define this process after new paradigm, different from the old one in 1994. Uh, we will first go back to the original 1994 paradigm before we discuss what has been changed from there. In 1994, the end of the Civil War, uh, Cold War witnessed the rise of the market-oriented reform in China and in other developing countries. And China also uh, changed its uh, reformed it's an aid structure by establishing the import export bank. So from that day on, the concessional loans replaced grants to be the major foreign assistance method. The evolving stakeholders' interests determine the process of decision-making process in the 1994 paradigm. So for the host country factor, um, Sri Lanka, for example, prefer aid for trade rather than just grants. So the host country first go to the Chinese embassy in Colombo, and the embassy will inform the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Beijing. And then for the China factor, the foreign, Ministry of Foreign Affairs will report to the State Council, 
and the State Council will convene a meeting with other st stakeholders and the ministries. And then the, they provide the subsidies to the import Axel Bank of China. And the banks will conduct a, a domestic competitive bidding for the uh, state-owned firms or private firms. And then for the globalization factor, a newly reformed uh, state of enterprises and other uh, government agencies finally step in and join the bidding and win the projects overseas. As the globalization process deepened, the stakeholders' interests also evolved as well. The globalization factor underwent the most drastic change. The original reform principle since 1984 for the state owned enterprises is self operating, self financing, self development, and self regulation. The accession to WTO in 2001 uh, accelerated this uh, market oriented reform. After that, the profit generating become the priority of the Chinese firms. However, in the 21st century, the domestic transportation infrastructure in China is nearing saturation. Yet the market potential in other post-war countries like Sri Lanka remains untapped. Also, the Chinese appreciation led to the surge in the ODI. So with the subsidies from the state to the foreign aid projects, and with the exclusive communication channel with Beijing and with host country government, uh, SOEs increasingly see the foreign system projects as a revenue, revenue generating activity. So for China factor, uh, the 1994 paradigm process as well as the non-intervention principle remains intact. We shall only recognize the host country government as a talking, legitimate talking partner. Yet, uh, they, o they also recognize there's a need to just promote the certain development me uh, method as a, a responsible stakeholder. For the host country level, the end of the civil war in Sri Lanka needs infrastructure financing for sure. So with the uh, overseas market for the infrastructure, Chinese uh, state-owned enterprises are also incentivized to exploit the market. However, such activities are not regulated by the nation-based nation 1994 paradigm. Beijing government passively provides the, uh, the subsidies upon the request of the host government. So with the nature change, especially in the globalization factor, we have the new uh, paradigm the featured by the enterprises exploit the market and the government convey, which we'll explain the next, chap uh, next slide. Um, the specific steps under the new paradigm will be discussed here. Um, and through the lens of the China Harbor and its projects uh, in the Hamantota port. Uh, in the first step, the China Harbor uh, established itself locally with the uh, host government uh, through the donation-based aid projects in 1994 paradigm. After the in Indian tsunami, Indian Ocean tsunami, China Harbor repaired a fishery port in the south part of the country and won the trust of, of the Raja Pax administration as a, just a purely policy enforcer. And in the second step, the real life in Sri Lanka need to build a fishery port in Hamatota. China Harbor then proposed a huge, gigantic, ambitious plan, which is the Hamatota Harbor. And it, for, for this proposal, it can be seen, at least for, for the China Harbor, it's a, it's a project that has the intersection between the development interests of Sri Lanka and the commercial interests of itself. So in the third step, the China factor came into play. The President Mahinda Rajapaksa visited China and brought up the request for concessional loans for Hamantota port in 2007. Yet what China offered is 6% interest rate plus 3% uh, insurance, which is not as favorable as the offers proposed by Korea and Japan, but Sri Lanka still choose China's offer and uh, China Harbor win the project. So in the fourth step, uh, to further fulfill the meat of the resp uh, fiduciary responsibility, China Harbor not only just uh, get the financial 
support from the Chinese bank anymore, but also from the other international banks, like Japanese bank. And also, it gradually become a commercial actor in developing the Kuala Lumpur city. And for, through these steps, the commercial need of the Chinese state-owned enterprises is fulfilled um, as the profit margin is higher and higher from a donation-based project to the concessional loans-based project and to the purely commercial developer uh, in real estate. So, uh, but it is crucial to note that it was the exclusive communication channel the state-owned enterprises enjoyed with Beijing and the host government as a policy enforcer uh, in 1990s that make its evolution possible. So the new paradigm left us a lot of things to discuss. The first thing is that there's a mismatch between the non-intervention-based legal framework in China and the new realities of the economic involvement of the profit-seeking firms in the domestic economic affairs in Sri Lanka. The best example is the inclusion of the China Harbor's proposal into the Sri Lanka's national development agenda, Mahinda Chitana. China Harbor is proud uh, because they believe they successfully share the development knowledge with, uh, with host country, but the China's legal system hasn't catch up yet to regulate these overseas uh, economic activities or even blind to this presence. China Harbor is not an isolated case. Uh, China National Machinery Import Export Corporation also follow the same path. One of the major weaknesses exposed by such mismatch is the lack of uh, multi-stakeholder engagement in the decision-making process as well as in the feasibility report. The ignorance of the role of the SOEs in the legal system doesn't encourage them to talk with the, with the non-state actors in Sri Lanka. And um, even though this kind of talk can be very efficient, and also the relationship with the state and SOEs is also shifting. The SOEs start as a purely policy enforcers and the state control in the 1994 uh, uh, paradigm, and then evolve into a sort of a decision maker who actively engage with the host country government to identify areas of both development and commercial interest. Whereas the China state plays a supporting role in terms of the investment treaties and uh, financing for the risk management. So, uh, for the next step, we have seen that SOEs are moving towards international capital market as the domestic credit is draining up recently. Uh, such public-private relationship in China's foreign assistance agenda is not only in Sri Lanka, but also prevalent in Sudan, Myanmar, and other developing countries. This relationship can be mutually benefiting as well as conflict generating. We have seen a divergence between the commercial interest and the China's national interest in Sudan and Myanmar as commercial actors are using up the dip diplomatic credits to ensure the safety of their own commercial operation. The extreme example is the creation of Malacca Dilemma as a security threat to justify the competition between the ma major two oil companies in Myanmar. And the good news is that the reform of, of SOEs will, ref, uh, will continue and is moving towards the trends of anti-aid. So that a new paradigm of China foreign assist, assistance cannot fulfill its original goal in three perspectives. The first of all is that the new paradigm doesn't contribute greatly to solve the problem of the increasing uh, disparity between, uh, of the distribution between the labor and uh, a capital in the globalization process in other developing countries. The goal of common development is undercut by a lack of multi-stakeholder engagement in the decision-making process, which restrained uh, uh, more domestic actors to express the concerns over development priorities. The best example is that the, market, uh, the agriculture modernization pro uh, projects are in absence, and the climate, climate change mitigation projects are in absence in Sri Lanka. And secondly, the new initiative doesn't contribute towards the ethnic uh, reconciliation, or oh, not greatly, because 
It is also the problem with the uh, with the with the lack of voice of the ethnic minorities in the in the decision making process. And also, the policy suggestion is to horizontally connect Beijing, host government, host country government, private sector, and the civil society into the decision making process to generate projects that are both socially valuable and economically viable, and to incentivize China to do so. And the proposal of the twin track under the current negotiation of Paris Declaration of Aid Effectiveness should be considered or even adopted because uh, it, it recognized the need of the commercial actors from other South donor countries. At, at the same time, the principle of multi stakeholder engagement can be imposed. So thank you. Thank you, Xiao, for that uh, fascinating analysis of the kind of Chinese aid program in Sri Lanka today. Actually, if you look at Sri Lanka's aid history, uh, the very interesting shifts with the Chinese aid program. In fact, 1952, uh, one of the first agreements of post-independence Sri Lanka was with China, for, which was called the Rubber Ice Agreement. And private conversation, she mentioned to me how within the Chinese side, they considered uh, one of the assistance Sri Lanka gave because um, at that time they needed rubber a lot. But uh, then in uh, the 1960s, uh, China became the largest donor to Sri Lanka. When the United States stopped its development assistance program, when we nationalized the uh, oil distribution. So, but that was a period of former China, the time of the Communist Party. Now we see a different mode of aid with the SOEs playing such a big role. And as you mentioned with the 1994 law, and which also sometimes have principles of non-interference, like, but at the same time, highly commercial entities playing a, a big role. So now we have an interesting range of papers which shows both the promise and the perils of aid. On one hand, we have an interesting story of a fund that has achieved quite a bit, but the Nepal other case study presents lots of issues, how the aid has operated in that context. Farah uh, told us about how a simple conceptual categorization of a group of people within a framework that is very dominant in an agency, how much issues that it creates, and Zhao's last last uh, presentation bring us Sri Lanka's eight pictures to the present, uh, which is the post-war period, the, uh, the one of the most important uh, aid actors in Sri Lanka is, is China. So with these comments, I'll open the four papers for questions, comments. Uh, please, I'll try and collect several, uh, several uh, questions. Please be brief, introduce yourself, and, uh, and let, let's start. Five district of northern province, almost 90,000 Muslims uh, in 1990 November. And this was happened, this was the first ethnic cleansing. It happened in the whole world even before Bosnia. In Sri Lanka it happened. And I remember even UNHRC aware of it at that time. I myself went with some officials of uh, United, uh, Embassy of USA to visit these border villages where these peace people were there. But anyway, um, thanks to Sepha, you know, you are bringing all these things together. After 24 years, this is a 
great thing and uh, good fight you are given in recognizing these people and uh, documenting all these process. But as a peace dividend, uh, now uh, the process of uh, returning these refugees back to northern provinces are taking place. Uh, by a large, uh, you know, there are certain steps. Even Osmania College has been established. Recently, the college schools were functioning and uh, all these things are happening in Jaffna. So in the meantime, finally, uh, uh, you were talking about all your work. Have they recognized uh, your documentation? This is what I want to find out, the end results. Uh, the UNHRC on your... Let's collect a number of questions, but please be brief and... Aylan? Yeah, uh, quick question to Farah and also Zhao. Um, Farah, I'm just wondering the kind of productive use of Agamben in this context, right? Whether UNHCR and so on just see that as bare life or they have hierarchical ways of looking at IDPs. Because those hierarchies, this is my question, do they get then reproduced by the locals? Right? An international agency creates a certain hierarchy about who's important. Now, for example, if you take the Indian housing scheme which, around which we have a campaign in, in Jaffna for Northern Muslims and the attitudes of different officials, you know, this attitude that the UNHCR established and how that gets then reimposed on how the Sri Lankan bureaucracy looks at it Right? Or the, because it's not an all or nothing, that's the, my problem with Agamben, it's an all or nothing attitude towards a community, but there is these hierarchies of power in terms of how they view it. And a question to Zhao is, I, I don't, I'm not sure I've completely followed um, your presentation, but so now with these state-owned enterprises, right, which are definitely working with commercial interests, you know, what happens if, and because China is also intervening in many African countries all over the world and so on, what happens when a, a state defaults on a loan, right? Then does the Chinese state's muscle kick in in, in some form? You know, what is the relationship between these enterprises as, you know, seeking profit, capitalist profit, and the Chinese state? And will, it, will that also make a difference if these were not state-owned enterprises, because in the case of the US, I think when a Wall Street bank is in trouble, they'll intervene to make sure they bail out, right, if it's in another country. But with the, what is the thinking in China on that? Questions? Okay, let me turn to far end. Okay, uh, in relation to whether the work that we have done uh, is being recognized, uh, there has been some evidence of it being recognized and I hope uh, that it continues to be. We translated the, the commission report to, into Tamil and Singhala and that has, you know, and we did some programs so that was, you know, another way in which we disseminated. So hopefully, yes. Uh, in relation to Ahilan's question about Agamben and hierarchization, um, I think in the local context, there's definite hierarchies at different levels, you know, because of politics, because of the local context, because of the histories in the north, those kinds of things. But I think at the UNHCR level, I prefer the Agamben version because I think it also speaks then to the way in which, um, you know, UNHCR works with, with in, in the Vanni and can do, continue to do so, even, you know, very clearly seeing that the, kind, the sort of the resettlement process that is being engaged in is also highly problematic, right? I mean, for me, it makes it clearer then that, that uh, you know, the, the, the sort of the Agamben notion makes those kinds of things clearer, that sort of, that it's the bare life uh, categorization only that they're thinking about, right? And that is the basis on which it, they sort of uh, justify uh, their presence. And, you know, then sort of this sort of assertion of humanitarianism and neutrality because it's about saving lives and all of that. So therefore, I, I prefer that for, for understanding that kind of commitment. And, but I do recognize that at the local level, there is um, hierarchization according to different kinds of logics. So thank you for your question. Uh, what if the state defaults on the loans? Uh, uh, 
it's a, it's a, it's a huge question, but we, we haven't got enough evidence yet. Well, I, what I can only answer right now is from the several projects in Sri Lanka, because the nature of these projects are basically BOT projects, built, operation, and a turn, turn, turnkey. So, uh, actually, the owner of the loan uh, of the project is Sri Lanka, and the Chinese state-owned state -owned enterprises kick in as the contractors of the project rather than the owners. And when they negotiate uh, before, before the uh, pro launch of the project, they have already, uh, most of them have already agreed that if the, the project default, the state default, then the, uh, the operation period for the, for the Chinese companies will be extended. So for example, for, for Hamantota port, let us say that after it is built, and the China Harbor will run for maybe 10 or 20 years to ensure that uh, they got enough pro profit to turn back the keys and the interest they need, to, uh, they need to pay. So usually the BOT projects won't default. And default will be uh, avoided by the extension of the operation period of Chinese enterprises. And another point I'd like to respond is that uh, uh, if the state default, it will be very ugly for China just to take over or something. So usually the conventional method is just that uh, before every new administration of China, they will just visit some country and they will write off the loans before the things get too bad. They, well, they, that is what they usually do. And the third thing is that the only example I can imagine as a defaulting is a Misung Dam in the uh, in Myanmar, and the, the, the problem for the default is, is, the, is the, actually the lack of multi-stakeholder engagement. That's why I read the paper and just reduced the, the risks for that, and that's it. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other comments? Um. I'd actually like to reference the two presentations by Mr. Bishnu and Mr. Rajib, but my question is actually to Ms. Hanifa. Uh, I mean, in terms of, sorry, I think, internal displaced persons or IDPs, uh, from my understanding, you can have them due to conflicts, development projects, or natural disasters. But in most cases, where the aid goes really depends on the most sensationalist situations, like you mentioned, where bare life is at stake. But uh, uh, the essence, isn't the state the person responsible for ensuring that all IDPs are given justice and uh, that their needs are met. And in the case of Sri Lanka, where I see still a continued disengagement between the state and donors, where uh, the clusters, the UN clusters, were primarily left to decide who gets aid. And to an extent, it could be the lack of uh, interest on both sides, on the part of the state and on the part of the UN agencies and the donors to actually engage and sit down and maybe do something like what happened in Nepal uh, where the, the needs were identified and where funding was actually given to transitional justice and peace building initiatives as well. So to what extent do you think it was this disengagement of the state from uh, getting involved in donor priorities that is affecting how justice is happening in the north of Sri Lanka. And do you think the state could have played, the government of Sri Lanka could have played a more important role in defining who is an IDP and who should get this aid? Um, and I know you didn't reference this in your presentation, but I was wondering if you could also comment on, to, on how something like the Nepali Peace Trust Fund Initiative could still make a difference in Sri Lanka if Despite their differences, donors and the government actually sit down and come up with a comprehensive plan for transitional justice and sort it out despite challenges. Um, I actually have a question for Xiao. 
Um, I think one of the most interesting things about your, your presentation, your paper, was that you demonstrate how the China Harbor Engineering Group uh, first came to do some post-tsunami humanitarian work, then they built a fisheries port, then they proposed a huge harbor, and then the contract came through, and from your analysis, even though the terms were not necessarily as favorable as the Japanese and the Korean financing options, China, CHEG still managed to get the bid. So the way you describe it is that uh, the, the whole process is a way of the China Harbor Engineering Group, a uh, state-owned enterprise, moving up the value chain, entering through a humanitarian aid project and eventually becoming itself a very major kind of actor that influences economic policy decisions in the host country. And of course, in that process, China's own position is also consolidated. Now, you talk about changing that system, but, I, but what is the incentive to change it? I mean, uh, why would, it seems like it's quite a, quite a convenient arrangement for, you know, uh, the, the firm, at the firm level, in terms of the firm's own logic, to continue to, like you say, climb up the global value chain, uh, expand its markets, uh, increase market share, and so on and so forth. Uh, and also, it seems to work for the Chinese government. So what could possibly lead to any change, if, a, if at all? Uh, uh, this is again the, for Chinese uh, aid. Uh, now the answer was uh, given initially saying that some of the, if the amount cannot be um, repaid, the extension of the period is inevitable. That is, even though it is BOT, the period can be extended. So which means BOT can even be BOO. It's here. Uh, it's uh, the, the project. Uh, you just answered for previously that the BOT, if the Sri Lankan government cannot pay it, the period will be extended in order to recover the profits. That means it's, that area is not clear, as you said. And uh, so therefore it can even be, the BOT can be even BOO which is an indefinite thing. Uh, the other thing is, uh, with regard to aid, uh, I would like to compare the aid with World Bank and uh, some of the aid which we have received in the past for mega projects. Uh, now, with the, in the case of uh, World Bank, the, the service charge is a very nominal amount. It wouldn't exceed 3%. But according to you, uh, the aid is 6% plus 3%, which is 9%, which is three times the World Bank aid, the service charge which the Sri Lankan government would have uh, uh, been paying. So, which is a huge amount if you look at the, the, the size of the project. So, when you're like, calculating in billions, 3% to 9% is a huge jump in, in terms of money. And uh, uh, the other uh, thing is, now, in the case of uh, Mahavali, uh, the other case is the international bidding is avoided in this regard. Now, we, uh, the, uh, the, and also the transparency, because the public or even the parliament doesn't know whether these projects are really BOO or BOT, and the size and in which manner these things are awarded. Now, this is the first time we hear something uh, from uh, your side about various mechanisms that are involved, but which are never uh, been made public by the people who are supposed to be doing that. So the transparency is not there. So people do not know, and this cannot be debated in parliament for anyone. The second thing is uh, now with regard to World Bank aid, once the aid is given, the bidding process is independent. The country can go on international bids and then select the most suitable party uh, according to the specifications initially set out. 
Uh, I also said that I would like to draw a comparison to uh, Mahavali project. Now, Mahavali project was a total outright grant. There is no aid, there is no repayment back. So in a scenario like that, if it is awarded to the country which is giving the aid, it's okay because you cannot ask any questions. It's like looking at a, the teeth of a gift horse. But in this case, if you really analyze the, the interest rates and the service charge is extremely high, people are not aware as to how this is awarded, the transparency is not there, and uh, people even do not know whether it is BOT or BOO. And the other thing is, uh, uh, if, uh, if at the evaluation stage, if projects are very carefully, critically analyzed for profit, they should know exactly when they are making profits. Now, if you just take the Harbor Project, now everyone is being told that profits are not being made. So in a, uh, and also maybe with the airport. And if in a scenario like that, even before doing the project, people know that this project is not going to be uh, financially viable. Yeah. Can I? Yes. Is it finished? Have, have you finished? Yes, basically. There is time. Because I, I think in doing that, uh, we also need to analyze our ruling classes. I mean, China is not giving this loan without, uh, when you said that it's not debated in the parliament, then we'll have to ask our question, what is the nature of the parliament? What is the nature of our, our, our own elite? No? I mean, it's, it's a relationship. Second question I like to about the, this IDP question. I have come across the same thing in Ache. Um, this IDP classification, old and new, same by the UNHCR, and it led to huge political issue. The, my question from uh, Farah is: uh, Do you think it's a uh, one of the thing is this? Have you kind of look at the, this term IDP? Because I, I remember at one time in Sri Lankan discussion, I was talking about health project, and Sri Lankan government official told me, how can we provide health, to, uh, health support to IDPs when we don't have money to provide to other people? It was like in their own mind, IDP was a very strange category of Sri Lankans, which didn't fit into our health policy like. So, you know, you know, sometimes, actually, some of us long ago resisted UNHCR getting involved in the internal displays uh, through a law, this thing. Uh, the, that's what I want to occur. Is it something that you see within a humanitarian discourse within the UNHCR, or have you seen it in other places as well? Okay. Do you want to respond to that? I just uh, quickly response to the two questions. Uh, first one, I think the, the, the another, another question basically answered what Vijay asked me, because uh, uh, this kind of the new paradigm, which is at the current stage looks both fits the interests of the, of the firms and the development agenda of Sri Lanka, has the huge uh, weakness, is that it's, the, it's, the, it's not the most efficient way to allocate resources. Like uh, another gentleman mentioned that maybe the profits of the harbor is not as high as we exp what we expected. But just imagine if we can use this money, this amount of money for the, for the financial inclusion program in Sri Lanka, for the landless farmers, and they can provide so much more jobs locally and reduce in in inequality drastically. Um, uh, well, the, the way of new paradigm in Chinese term is called uh, uh, crossing the road by touching the stones. And China did that just because it is China's own development method in the 1990s, and we, we haven't found another way out yet. And it is in South Asia, it's a hub of social enterprises. So we have already seen a bridge there why bother still touching the stones? And so that's why I made this proposal here. It's not change, but not modifications to just make it uh, more beneficial to the, to the general public in, in terms of the employment and jobs. And uh, the second, uh, a lot of question is that when the BOT transferred to BOO, and usually if it is a BOO, then it will be the commercial projects like what the China Harbor did recently in 
uh, together with a Hong Kong-based private company in uh, just uh, develop the commercial, uh, the Colombo port city, the real estate project. So if it is a foreign citizen project, usually the regulation wise, it doesn't allow them to transfer to BOO. And uh, indeed, there's a transparency issue here. And it, it needs the efforts of, of both Sri Lankan people and Chinese people to work on it, on the regulation thing. And also, you, you mentioned about the interest rate of the World Bank and, uh, and, and Chinese uh, projects. Uh, well, the, the, the thing is that oh, the two banks, the World Bank and the, the BRICS Development Bank, which has China jointly proposed with Indiana countries recently, they concentrate in different areas. Maybe in World Bank, there's a more financial inclusive program that comes from the, the charity program. So the, the tolerance of the return is lower. But for the China's project and the, for the projects of the BRICS Development Bank, they usually focus on the infrastructure. The global-wise, uh, global wise, the, the, the investment return perspective is a little bit higher than the other, uh, other kind of the projects. So it's a, it's a difference on the industries, it's not really on the, uh, on the banks. And also the, the international bidding thing. Yes, it is uh, in 2000, around 2000 it was only open to uh, China's bidding and there should be a way to, uh, to move to, towards the more anti-aid. But the problem is that after financial crisis, uh, China and America talk about that uh, to launch the reform on World Bank on the IMF. In order to let China open its bidding process to international competitors, and China proposed that we should just have more voice in the two major banks, uh, in Britain World System, the IMF and the World Bank. Um, the American agreed, but the bill, the reform bill on IMF and the World Bank doesn't just can't go through the American Congress. And it was delayed and delayed and delayed. And just recently, just uh, maybe China think at the time it is too long. And then they have their own bank. And but for the, the new bank, the BRICS Development Bank, it is open to competitors through the emerging markets and the South donors, South countries. But it is still a gradual process for that. Um, transparency. Yeah, I think, uh, did I answer all of your questions? Okay. Um, in relation to the question about, um, you know, the state and the donors engaging and maybe that will result in something more positive, um, I'm not really sure um, because of, you know, like Sunil said, I think we also have to interrogate the nature of our state and I'm not convinced that uh, that might be the best direction to go in. And also in relation to, you know, donor interests, in relation to the Muslim community, right? I mean, the way in which it is perceived, what is the, what, how do sort of the relations between, you know, the politics of the community and the state play out and all of that? I'm not necessarily sure that that will play out in any positive way. So I'll just say that. Um, in relation to what uh, Sunil brought up, now part of my paper, this paper is actually about victimhood. And, you know, as much as it's about sort of the, how UNHCR defines victims, it's also about victims themselves mobilizing their own experiences, the, their own categorizations for their own good. So, I mean, for a long time, being an IDP uh, was uh, utilized also by the Northern Muslims. Right? And also they recognize now when a lot of people are trying to sort of give up that categorization of IDP, they recognize that actually I haven't have a um, reference in my paper too when uh, some people were like, you know, when we were IDPs, at least there was some kind of authority that looked after us, right? But if we give up, now I, we know how the poor are in Putlam, for instance, right? If we give that up, what is going to happen to us, right? So, you know, these categorizations also take on you know, lives of their own in, in uh, relation to different kinds of uh, institutions that get created. So, yeah, just. Thank you. I think oh, good timing. Um, thanks a lot for the four panelists. I think we had a very interesting uh, discussion about both promise and perils of it. 
Let me leave with one thought that uh, I think it's almost impossible to analyze foreign aid without politics. Uh, you know, we had all these ideas about, great ideas about Marshall Plan and being the beginning of the foreign aid. Recently, I read a new biography of Stalin. Actually, for Stalin, Marshall Plan was the beginning of the Cold War. <laughs> because as a first act after the Second World War, US did to cut off Soviet Union. And the uh, Russian interpretation of Marshall Plan was the beginning of the Cold War. So I think in, when I'm looking at foreign aid in many countries, bringing the political dimension becomes extremely important. Uh, I think one of the best textbooks I read is Economic Statecraft, which is actually looks at uh, the, how economic dimension is used for political way. Thanks a lot for the, uh, for the paper writers. And uh, hope to meet you all tomorrow at? Nine o'clock. Yeah. I think Vijay has proof.